Welcome back to another installment of Space This Week. Every Monday, I strive to bring you all the latest and greatest news pertaining to the past week of spaceflight, space news, and of course, SpaceX Starship updates. And regarding the latter, oh boy, are things getting exciting as we approach launch day. But has there been an unexpected setback? We also saw four Falcon 9 launches over the past week. China replaced an aging communication satellite. The International Space Station received a crew resupply mission and is working on some super interesting laser communication experiments. And we received images of both the most remote black hole ever observed with X-rays and the first ever data from the Euclid Space Telescope. All of this and so much more. Let's jump right into things. The hype is real. SpaceX shared some new footage of the latest Ship 25 and Booster 9 full stack, teasing the second launch of the world's biggest and most powerful rocket. In fact, they stated that they're aiming for no earlier than the 17th of November for the launch, which is the first time SpaceX have mentioned a specific date pending regulatory approval of course, so really there's still no clearance from the FAA, so there's still no concrete date and time. However, the fact that SpaceX are making such brazen statements means that there is a very good chance that they have been informed that approval will be coming very soon. Furthermore, on Saturday, SpaceX then posted an official live stream to watch the flight test. I'll link it below and look, it's scheduled to start on the 17th of November at 12.29pm. And it's not just the X post and live stream that gives us reason to believe all of this is really happening. On Thursday, Starship Gazer spotted flight termination system explosives on the move, ready for installation. The flight termination system is basically the self-destruct mechanism for Starship, and for hopefully obvious reasons, the explosives aren't installed and armed while the rocket is sitting being worked on, they're installed at the very last stage. The explosives were installed on both Booster 9 and Ship 25, which was then followed by stacking of Ship 25 on top of Super Heavy for hopefully the final time. Another indication that this is really it was the recent removal of the net under the orbital launch mount. But wait a second, what is this? At the weekend, we unexpectedly saw Ship 25 removed from the top of Booster 9 again. But there's more. This was then followed by another removal of the hot stage ring from the top of Booster 9 again. What reason would SpaceX have for this? Routine checks? Or are there problems with the booster? There are some things to bear in mind when SpaceX do this. Firstly, it isn't the same as removing rings from the rest of Super Heavy or Starship stacks, as these are welded together. The hot staging ring is not welded to Booster 9. It's instead just held down via the same clamps that are used to hold onto the ship back when there was no hot stage ring at all in the final stack. The reason the hot stage ring needs to be removable is because it covers the Super Heavy's batteries, avionics systems and grid fin motors, as well as other bits of hardware, and these need to be accessible for maintenance and inspections. We're hoping that this latest removal is just another avionics battery and motor check, and it's not an indication of anything serious. Who knows, by the time you're watching this video, it may well have been reinstalled. Here's hoping. One kinda random but interesting thing that happened at Starbase last week was the flyby of an aircraft near the tower. This kind of flight path requires permission, given that this is an orbital launch facility, and such permission is very rarely granted to aircraft. I wonder who the aircraft belonged to, who was in it, and what information led to the permission being granted for them to fly this close to the site. Do you have any theories? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And if you're enjoying today's video, guys, then don't forget to leave a thumbs up down there as well. The algorithm hasn't been the kindest to me recently, so your support is always appreciated. Incredibly, SpaceX managed to pull off four orbital launches last week, all being Falcon 9, of course. In chronological order, on Wednesday, we saw Starlink Group 6-27 launch from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 40, consisting of 23 Starlink V2 satellites. And hey, check out the launch tower! Looks like SpaceX have finally installed the crew access arm to this launch pad, meaning that we should soon be able to see Crew Dragon missions start launching from this pad. Anyway, as for last week's Starlink mission, the rocket's first stage made a successful landing on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean, marking its 11th overall landing. 
The next Falcon 9 launch we saw last week was CRS-29, which launched on Friday from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy. This was SpaceX's 29th commercial resupply mission to the space station, and the Cargo Dragon spacecraft carried scientific research, technology demonstrations, crew supplies, and hardware, including NASA's Illuma-T and OR investigations. Illuma-T is designed to demonstrate how low Earth orbit missions can benefit from laser communications. Laser communication involves the use of infrared light to send and receive information at high rates of data, providing spacecraft with the ability to send more data back to Earth in a single transmission, facilitating the swift sending of information for researchers. Once Illuma-T is installed on the station, it'll be used to complete NASA's first ever in-space demonstration of two-way laser relay communication. Alongside the Illuma-T, the OR experiment will be installed and will use an infrared imaging instrument to measure the distribution, characteristics and movement of atmospheric gravity waves, and researchers will also use the equipment to observe how atmospheric gravity waves contribute to space weather and enhance our current understanding of the Earth's atmosphere, weather and climate. Saturday saw the week's third Falcon 9 mission, Transporter 9. This launched from the Vandenberg Space Force Base, and quite often Falcon 9 launches here are shrouded in fog and give little view of the ground. Happily, this wasn't the case for this particular mission. It was blue skies overhead as the rocket blasted off the launch pad, carrying a whopping 113 spacecraft to low Earth orbit. The transporter missions are SpaceX's rideshare missions, basically carrying a whole bunch of small payloads from a massive number of customers who individually pay a relatively small amount towards the cost of the launch because of how spread out the cost is. The payloads were all deployed gradually over the course of about half an hour, some detaching from the Falcon 9 itself directly, others deploying as clusters aboard orbital transfer vehicles for later deployment individually. As for the Falcon 9 first stage, an added benefit to the rocket launching during clear skies meant that we got an excellent view of the touchdown as the booster came to rest at landing zone 4 rather than a drone ship, though sadly as of yet SpaceX hasn't shared any third person view of this particular booster's 12th overall landing. The fourth Falcon 9 launch we saw overall took place on Sunday, this time back at Cape Canaveral Launch Complex 40. The payload for this mission was the O3B M Power 5 and 6 satellites, which were carried to medium Earth orbit by the rocket. The satellites were built by Boeing for Luxembourg company SES, and they will provide internet services over most of the populated world, covering 96% of the globe's surface, expanding SES's O3B network. The Falcon 9 first stage landed on the drone ship a shortfall of gravitas in the Atlantic Ocean, closing this Falcon 9's ninth overall launch and landing. Utilizing the capabilities of the Chanda X-ray Observatory and the James Webb Space Telescope, astronomers have made a groundbreaking discovery, identifying the most remote black hole ever observed in X-rays. This particular black hole is in an early phase in its growth, something never seen before. Currently, its mass is similar to that of its host galaxy. These findings will help researchers understand how some of the universe's first supermassive black holes formed. Another big step in the world of uh, space imagery last week happened on Tuesday, on which the Euclid Space Telescope mission, initially launched this July on a Falcon 9, unveiled its very first scientific images, showcasing the Perseus Cluster, a congregation of thousands of galaxies situated approximately 240 million light years away from Earth. Led by the European Space Agency with significant contributions from NASA, these first five images from Euclid showcases its potential to explore dark matter and dark energy and to help create the most extensive 3D map of the universe yet. We saw a launch from China last week. On Thursday, a Long March 3B carried the ChinaSat-6E satellite to geosynchronous Earth orbit. ChinaSat-6E is a communication satellite designed to replace the ChinaSat-6B, which was launched in 2007. Official sources have described the ChinaSat-6E as a communication satellite designed to provide reliable, stable and safe radio and television transmission and communication services. Sad news now, next Monday there won't be an episode of Space This Week as I'll be in Paris with Beardy Penguin competing in Spacecon's 24-hour eSports endurance event, so I won't be around to make a Space This Week episode unfortunately, which is doubly frustrating as it's looking like this would have been the episode to cover the Starship second flight test. Ah, if only the fish people had been faster to approve. Or slower, maybe it'll be delayed further and I'll still be able to talk about the launch while the news is still fresh. Lown Aerospace had a somewhat busy week last week, 
IRL, that is. Unfortunately, meaning that I didn't have a whole lot of time to make a KSP video. I did, however, have time to create a tribute to the Falcon 9 using KSP 2's new grid fin parts. Yep, they are stock. And you know, I actually really like how this video turned out, so give it a watch if you haven't already. Should be one of the cards clickable on screen. This episode of Space This Week, and all my other videos, was made possible thanks to my amazing Patreon and YouTube members, names on the left there. If you want to sign up, you can click the relevant links below or that one on screen. But yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for watching today's video, and I'll catch you in the next one. Write a comment about banjos if you made it this far, I don't know. <laughs>